It's mind-blowing how much we've been able to figure out about our universe. But it's really, really exciting when we see something out there that has yet to be explained. Fast radio bursts are an example of that. Until recently, we had no idea what these sudden flashes of radio emission coming from mysterious events out there in the universe really were. In fact, it turns out that our best ideas were wrong. So, an FRB is seen as a very quick flash of broad frequency radio emission from some spot on the sky. They last only a few milliseconds and appear to happen pretty randomly over the sky. That tells us they're probably not from the Milky Way or they'd be mostly seen in the galactic disk. It was only recently, April 2015, that astronomers finally pinpointed a galaxy that an FRB came from. It was an elliptical galaxy 6 billion light years away. And that distance measurement allowed scientists to calculate the FRB power output as that of 500 million suns. So what could cause such an insane energy output? Hot contenders were various types of cataclysmic events, like colliding stellar remnants, supernovae, neutron stars collapsing into black holes, crazy stuff like that. But then, just in March 2016, researchers reported something completely unexpected and never before seen. A fast radio burst repeated itself. In fact, Checking through archival data, it was found to have repeated itself multiple times. These bursts happened in 2012 and 2015 and were all detected by the enormous Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico. This completely rules out the cataclysmic scenarios for FRBs. Their origin has to be something that doesn't destroy the source. Now the best contenders involve young neutron stars which rotate at insane rates and occasionally give off extremely intense bursts as their rotation glitches and starquakes rock these intensely energetic objects. This is all still wide open, but now that we know that fast radio bursts can repeat, we're sure to catch one in the act and puzzle this one out before too long. Now, on to our challenge question answer. It was a two-parter. The first asked the following. How far did the cosmic microwave background photons that we see now have to travel in order to reach us? Okay, this wasn't a trick question, but the answer was a lot simpler than you may have thought. The light traveled 13.7 billion light years. Yeah, it traveled exactly at the speed of light, and it did that for 13.7 billion years, the age of the universe. It's as simple as that. I just gave you way more information than you needed to solve it. Kudos to the many people who successfully discarded the irrelevant info and got this right. Okay, now for the mathy one. I asked you what average distance a photon could travel through the universe before the moment of recombination, the moment when the cosmic microwave background was released. At this time, the universe was full of plasma, atomic nuclei and free electrons. It's those electrons that were the problem for light. See, free electrons are really, really good at getting in the way of photons. They have what we call a large scattering cross-section, which means that even though the electrons themselves are infinitesimally small, photons don't have to get too close before they interact via the electromagnetic force. We can simplistically think of this interaction region as a solid circle. Photons passing inside the circle interact and are scattered. Those passing outside do not. This isn't exactly what's really happening, but the approximation does allow us to estimate how far a photon can travel before encountering an electron. By the way, the number that defines the size of this circle for electrons is called the Thomson scattering cross-section, and it's 6.65 by 10 to the minus 29 meters squared. Protons and helium nuclei, the other common charged particles hanging around the universe at this time, have much smaller scattering cross-sections than electrons do, so we're not even going to worry about them. Okay, first, we need to figure out how close those electrons are to each other. We need to find their density at the moment of recombination. There's a couple of ways to go about this, but let's use a number that's easy to find online. The baryonic mass of the universe which is estimated at 10 to the power of 53 kilograms. That's the mass of all the protons and neutrons in the observable universe. But what about the electrons? 
they weigh almost nothing compared to the baryons. But we do know that there are about as many of them as there are protons. So, divide the 10 to the 53 kilograms by the mass of the proton, and we get that there are six by 10 to the 79 protons in the observable universe, and just as many electrons. But what about the neutrons? Forget them. 75% of the baryonic mass is in hydrogen, which has just one proton and no neutrons. For the rest, it's about half-half protons and neutrons, but our estimate of the total mass isn't accurate enough to bother factoring this in. All of those electrons existed at the moment of recombination, so let's get the electron density back then. The redshift of the CMB is 1089, so that's also how much smaller the universe was back then. 46.6 billion light years in radius now translates to 42.3 million light years then, which is a volume of 2.7 times 10 to the 71 cubic meters. Spread that ridiculous number of electrons out evenly, and we get that there were 200 million electrons in every cubic meter at the moment of recombination. That's way up from the 0.2 electrons per cubic meter that we find now. So, how far would a photon have to travel before bumping into one of these electrons? Think of each electron as a target, with a radius equal to its scattering cross-section. Now, imagine the photon is able to look ahead and see all of its possible paths along a column. That column is filled with targets, and the further ahead the photon looks, the more of its possible paths are blocked by these targets. There's a distance forward, at which the photon's view ahead is completely blocked. Any photon traveling that distance is probably going to have hit an electron. That distance is called the mean free path. If we say the cross-sectional surface area of the column is a square meter, then each one meter length of the column has a fraction blocked equal to the number of electrons in that column segment, which is just the electron density, times the scattering cross-section of the electron. Divide the cross-sectional surface area of the column by the blocked surface area, and we have the number of these one meter segments before all the photons possible paths forward are blocked. Now we simplified here because some of those electron targets are going to overlap, but it turns out that we still get the right answer. Some photons travel further, some not so far, but this number is the mean free path. Plug our numbers into this equation, and we get a mean free path of around 7,500 light years. Okay, wow, that's a big number. But it's right. That hot plasma at the moment of recombination wasn't the thick searing fog that we sometimes imagine. It was pretty diffuse. But 7,500 light years is still very small compared to the size of the universe, even back then. And so, we still consider the pre-recombination universe as being opaque. Now, some of you got this part right too, so huge props to you if you did. Okay, and the winners. If you see your name scrolling below, we've chosen your correct answer to receive a PBS Spacetime t-shirt. You guys should email us at pbsspacetime at gmail.com with your mailing address, US t-shirt size, so small, medium, large, etc. And also, let us know whether you'd prefer an I'll science anything I want t-shirt or a black hole orbits t-shirt. The rest of you can just go ahead and buy one in the link below. See you all next week for a brand new episode of Spacetime.